Good afternoon, class. I wanted to take a minute to thank you all for your excellent participation uh, last week. I I'm a little sorry that the board got so um, uh, packed full of, of all your fantastic responses. Uh, hopefully this week and in future weeks it'll be a little bit more manageable. What I was asking you to do was to um, sort of put into practice the uh, ideas of Oscar Kuhlmann, if, if you kind of got the connection there. Um, Kuhlmann gave, you know, in his piece that we read, some concrete arguments for believing um, that the New Testament itself embodies um, salvation history. My nose always itches when I get on camera, and no exception. Um, so here's the thing about salvation history. What we're looking for really fundamentally is a theology of history, evidence of a theology of history. This is on the part of the New Testament writers or uh, our Lord himself in terms of believing that, one, history has different periods in it. Uh, two, history is, it's God ultimately that determines the, the, the times and the seasons. In other words, you know, he'll determine the length of the periods, the purpose of the periods from an overall plan that he's decreed. And also he'll determine when one period gives way to the next and how many periods are going to be and so on and so forth. Um, that fundamentally is what we're looking for. Um, now, we also could point out to things like eschatological tension where uh, we're in the here and now and the not yet. The New Testament's full of, of that kind of, of evidence also. Uh, Paul especially, when, especially when Paul, like in Romans and Galatians and many other places, speaks of the Holy Spirit that we've been given as a first installment, a down payment, meaning that we've gotten the gift of salvation, but we haven't quite gotten the full thing yet. We've, we've gotten it, but we haven't gotten it. So the Spirit is, in effect, our surety that we're ultimately going to get the rest. That's the way Paul understands it. It's a two-stage process. You start with the Spirit and then you get the rest. Okay, and then we're sort of in the intermediate stage. So the first point of inflection has happened. Uh, salvation has come, or as he puts it in Galatians, faith has come, and by faith has come, he doesn't mean faith has come to us personally. He means the time of faith has come. Um, and maybe we'll look at that in a moment. But Jesus himself speaks of different ages in salvation history as well. Um, just incidentally, in the Gospel of Matthew, we can see several places of this. The very last line of Matthew is very is interesting, uh, where Jesus says, Lo, I, I will be with you till the end of the age. And he also says in Matthew 11, um, yes, Matthew 11, oh, I'm sorry, Matthew 12, uh, 32, where he says, whoever says a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. So what are these ages that he's talking about? Well, uh, it would take some exegesis to really nail that down for sure, but what it reveals is certainly he believes that there are ages, and these ages are going to correspond in some way to the flow of history. Um, it was very interesting, actually, in the Gospel of Matthew, and I pointed this out on the board, and I wanted to make sure that you, you all saw this. Um, the emergence of John the Baptist for, for Jesus is a very, very important sign, especially when the prophet begins to suffer his own persecution, when he's finally arrested by Herod and is taken away, and he's about to be put to death. This is really the first sign that Jesus knows is being not only the beginning of his ministry, but really this this time of the inbreaking of the kingdom, um, the, this sort of inbreaking of, of this new period, which is going to be marked actually initially by a great deal of pain and suffering and tribulation. Um, that's why he says in uh, Matthew eleven twelve, he says, uh, truly, after he praises John the Baptist, he says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. Okay, and the men of violence take it by force, for the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So the prophets and the law basically are coming to an end with the period of John the Baptist, which is inaugurating a new period. And you can see that actually... Uh, and you also see this in Mark 2, by the way, that when 
as soon as Mark is arrested in the very first chapter, you're, you're liable to miss this, but Mark gets arrested almost in the very beginning, or John gets arrested almost in the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, in 114, this is in Mark 114, Jesus comes into Galilee after John was arrested, preaching the Gospel and saying, the time is fulfilled. Okay, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. John the Baptist really seems to mark the, the, the turning point of the age, the, the, the age of the inbreaking in of the kingdom. Okay, and this, this is actually very important. Now, if we had a lot more time to really deeply study the eschatological picture of the, of the synoptics especially, we would probably also want to tie it into the so-called Little Olivet Discourse, which, which is the, the various signs of the inbreaking which Jesus prophesies, and, and the, that, that's found in Mark 13, chapter 13, and parallels in uh, Matthew and Luke. Um, but, and, and indeed, the book of Revelation is in some sense a whole sort of macro version of that, if, if you want to kind of, kind of compare them. But, um, so, so that's, that's a very um, Im important phase. Now, Jesus himself probably did not invent this idea. Okay, um, and neither did Paul, and neither did any of the other New Testament writers. They probably developed the idea of salvation history, probably from places in the Old Testament, especially like the book of Daniel. Those of you who are really familiar with the Old Testament, you can look in various places like Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and you can see that um, in, in Daniel chapter 7 especially, there's this famous um, uh, vision by the prophet Daniel of these four succeeding beasts, um, each of whom, we're told, represents four kingdoms that will, in succession in history, oppress God's people. Okay, and so the, e each of these is, is, in effect, a, a blueprint for salvation history, if you will, because by the time the fourth kingdom arises, that is, in effect, the trigger moment for, for you know, the final age of history beginning. Because once that kingdom falls, then we see the beginning of the reign of the Son of Man over the earth. And so all of this is kind of carefully coded in, in, in effect, a timetable so that this, this all falls for the New Testament writers according to the plan decreed by God uh, from before. So this is, again, very salvation historical. Now, uh, I'm not going to say a lot about Luke and Acts except to point out um, that, that Acts has a couple of very famous passages dealing with salvation history. Um, first of all, it's mentioned quite a bit in Acts 1 when, when Jesus uh, responds to the question, are you now going to bring the kingdom to this at this time? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Basically, this idea of God sort of uh, decreeing points in history and, and in effect, um, arranging things or um, is taken for granted in Acts. It's found again and again and again. And you find, in effect, the whole of salvation history is kind of sketched out in a macro way in the speech of Stephen Martyr, which is in Acts 7. And again, also somewhat in the speech of Paul, which is in Acts 13. And, you know, as many people have noted, the speeches of Paul in the latter portion of Acts are very similar in many ways to the speeches of Peter in the first portion of Acts. So, all of these figures in the, in the book of Acts are speaking in terms of, of this salvation history. So this is not an uh, idea that's really difficult to find in Acts now that I've told you it's there. And again, we will study Luke and Acts in greater detail later. Now, John is kind of the difficult one. Um, the, the problem with John is, does John really have a theology of history? And that's, that's kind of um, the, the, the big question about the fourth gospel. Most uh, students of the fourth gospel, uh, me included, think that the eschatological picture in John is a lot different than the eschatological picture in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tend to be uh, kingdom-focused in the sense that the kingdom is coming now. So it's coming, and in one sense it's here, in another sense it's not here yet. Okay, so we're in this period between here and now and not yet. Okay, whereas, and mostly it's not yet. Whereas in the Gospel of John, it, it's mostly about what we have right now, the salvation that we have right now at present. Okay, uh, you know, in other words, the, the, the Gospel seems to be written from the point of view of the whole eschatological framework being reworked. So you really can't count on the eschatological tension in the Gospel of John to really uh, 
um, support the idea of salvation history because there isn't that much eschatological tension in the Gospel of John. And so this was one of the, probably one of the weaker points of Kuhlmann's argument in terms of salvation history of the Gospel of John. Now, I think you can point out, however, things about the Gospel of John that do suggest um, uh, participation of Jesus' own career and ministry in, in light of a larger narrative. Okay, and, and I, you know, I would look at places like um, John chapter 4, where, where he speaks with the woman at the well. Um, again, th th there is a sense of old worship and new worship, and there's sort of been a transition between worship, which was bound to place, which is you know, debating about here and now, do we worship Jesus here? Uh, it, it, or, sorry, do we worship the, the Father uh, in Zion or do we uh, do it in uh, Mount Gerizim? That was the famous dis dispute between the Samaritans and the Jews. And, and the age is in effect turned over now that now we're in the age of the Spirit. And so these questions are not important anymore because the Father is now looking for people who will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Okay, so it presupposes the change of an age. And you can find other passages like this in John to make a case for salvation history. I'm just saying it's not quite as salient as you find it in, in uh, Matthew, Mark, and especially in Luke, and especially in Acts. Now, it's everywhere you look in Paul. Uh, salvation history is a very, very common uh, theme in Paul. Let's just look at Romans quite briefly. Um, and I'll show you a couple things, some of which you found, some of which uh, you didn't. Um, so, looking here in uh, Romans, and again, th there's other things I'm passing over here, but I just wanted to point out, like in Romans 3, uh, in Romans 3.21, this very, very dense passage, it says, but now the righteousness of God, so you see this, but now, that, that whole but now. But now, as opposed to what? Well, as opposed to before. Um, as opposed, what's before? Well, going back to the previous verse, no human being will be justified in his sight by works of the law, since through the law come knowledge, comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been revealed. Something has happened between this problem of the law and the re revelation of the righteousness of God. That's key. This whole but now suggests, again, a point of inflection, a changing of an age. And and anytime you hear that but now, that nunade in Greek, be attentive to that when you're reading in Paul, because really what Paul is saying is, is that there's you, something was some way before, but now it's different. Something has changed. There's been this great shift in history. Okay? And what does he go on to say? Uh... The righteousness of God, but now has been manifested apart from the law, apart, although the law, the prophets bear witness to it. Okay, the righteousness of God through faith, uh, this one says, in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction. All sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now, Hear this. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the former sins. It was to prove at the present time that he himself uh, is, righteous, is, is righteous and that justifies him who has, well, what it should be translated as the, the, the faith of Jesus or faith like Jesus. But at any rate, uh, there's this period of forbearance where God passed over the former sins that period's over, okay, and now it's to prove at the present time that the one who has faith like Jesus had is justified by that faith. Okay, so again, a transition of an age here, very important, okay. Um, you see this again in Romans 5, 12 through 14. Um, sin came into the world. This is the famous original sin verse. Sin came into the world through one man and death through, uh, through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. Now this is just literally packed in terms of material to drag out. There is typology there, again, which we, we could say more about in, in another lesson, but I wanted just to point out here 
this idea of, of periods of salvation history in the Old Testament are presupposed. There's this time before the law. So when there was no law, there's no accounting of sin. There is sin, but there's nothing there to count sin. There's nothing there to, to in effect, rack up the sin total, if you will. But uh, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So there's this period from Adam to Moses. Moses where we get the law. So you have the before law period, the after law period, and then you have the now period. So for Paul, it seems like there's three different ages in salvation history. The Adam to Moses period, the Moses uh, to current period, the reign of, of, of sin and death through the law, and the time, the reign of Jesus Christ. And there will also be a fourth uh, age as well, and that's the age to come. And by the way, does Paul believe in an age to come? Uh, yes, most definitely. Um, in fact, he believes that the current age is uh, passing away. Let's take a look here. Again, this is a fairly well-known passage in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. And here Paul gives his, uh, his thoughts on marriage and celibacy. Um, and what you should do if you're married and what you should do if you're not married. But I want to take a note here that this advice is specifically sort of time-bound. This is not advice that Paul would be giving in a different age if he had been preaching to a people in a different age. And it probably isn't going to be for a future age either. Okay, the idea is if you're married, you should seek to stay married. If you're not married, you should seek to stay not married. But it's better to marry than to be unhappy as a married person. You can read the argument yourself. But my point is what I want to get into now is talking about how um, the, the, the change, effectively trying to change your status in this, this age. Um, and he says the same thing about being circumcised and uncircumcised. You shouldn't, if you're circumcised, you shouldn't try to undo it, which, by the way, happened in the ancient world. If you're uh, not circumcised, you shouldn't become circumcised. You, you, in other words, you shouldn't try to change Jewish and Gentile boundaries just like you shouldn't try to change married and single boundaries. And why does he say this? Well, he says, uh, uh, going on, he gives a whole bunch of advice here. And then it, by the time you get to, to 1 Corinthians 7, verse uh, 30 and 31, Actually, 29, let's go back and read that to read a complete sentence. I mean, brethren, the appointed time has grown very short. Okay. The appointed time has grown very short. Do you hear that? Um, from now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Okay. Let, let those who mourn uh, live as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. Those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For... The form of this world is passing away. Again, this is a blatant statement of we're in effect in living in one age now, but the age we're living in now actually is slowly giving way to the new age already as we speak. And again, this is Paul's way of expressing this idea of eschatological tension. There's, there's a sort of painful inbreaking of the kingdom where these two ages are in effect overlapping each other. We still are living in signs of the old age and yet the new age is sort of breaking out all around us. It's a very fascinating way of looking at it. And again, my point of giving you this little mini lecture here is not so much that, that you remember each of these examples, but that your own reading of the New Testament is enriched and enhanced and you can start to hear, train your ear to hear and to see um, new things that you really would not have noticed anyway. Most people don't read or listen to the New Testament with the sense of time and age and any kind of a theology of history. Hopefully now you will be able to do just that.